Now, I love legal movies as much as the next person. A good courtroom drama can be a really fun way to spend two hours or 10 hours if you're binging it on Netflix. But either way, as a lawyer, as I watch these, I have certain pet peeves that drive me absolutely crazy every time I see them. So what are they? I'm gonna count my top five on this week's video. Happy Friday, everybody. Hope you're having a great week. Gearing up for a good weekend, and the Texas Rangers are World Series champions, so my week has been pretty awesome so far. This week, we're talking about my top five pet peeves when it comes to legal movies or TV shows, specifically in the trial setting. There's a lot of things that Hollywood gets wrong about the legal profession in general, but for this video, I'm only talking about those movies or shows that show a criminal trial, because that's where my experience is. Just like anything else, your mileage on this answer may vary because different lawyers have different opinions, and that's totally cool. So let's start. All right, number five, pet peeve number five. A lot of times in movies or in TV shows, it seems like the trial is happening like a week after the crime was committed or a couple weeks at most right? This is not how it works in the real world. In the real world, criminal cases are in pretrial proceedings or pretrial litigation for a long time, sometimes years. I had a case back in 2018 that I went to trial on, very complex, very high level federal fraud case. That case had been pending for almost four and a half years before we were eventually able to go to trial especially when you get into the federal world and there's multiple defendants, these cases can take a long, long time. And obviously with movies, you're usually dealing with some type of high profile case or some you know, heinous offense like murder, sexual assault, something like that. Those are complicated cases. There are so many moving parts. And so the likelihood of those cases going to trial within a matter of weeks or months is virtually zero. I mean, that case is going to be pending for a long time. So that's number five. Number four, pet peeve number four is what I call the bulldog lawyers or the grandstanding lawyers. This is that typical thing you see where a lawyer is in a courtroom in front of a judge, in front of a jury, and they're being just completely over the top dramatic. They are yelling, they are pounding the table. And in some instances, that's okay, right? There are very, very few times, however, that that is in the real world going to be effective or even allowed by the judge, right? There are limits to what lawyers can do in the courtroom and still abide by what are called the rules of decorum. Plenty of lawyers in the real world have gotten into trouble and been sanctioned because they've been kind of this super animated over the top personality. And why this is really a pet peeve is because it sets expectations for clients at an unreasonable level. They expect their lawyer to go in and pound the table and flip chairs and throw papers and be this super aggressive defense lawyer. And at least in my opinion, the way I practice, that's not the most effective way to get a good resolution. And so it's hard a lot of times for me to talk my client down off of that expectation. So the grandstanding lawyers, the bulldog lawyers, that's pet peeve number four. Okay, pet peeve number three. This one kind of goes along with the grandstanding lawyers, but it is this thing that is become a trope in legal movies or shows. And it's a lawyer that will ask a question, whether it's on direct examination or cross-examination, they will ask a question that they know is a thousand percent objectionable and improper, but they ask it. And then as soon as the other lawyer gets up and says, objection, your honor, they say, withdraw the question. And then they go and sit down. Okay. That simply doesn't happen in real life. And if it did, it'd be incredibly ineffective and you'd probably get in trouble from the judge. The judge would probably have a lot to say about if you ever do that in my courtroom again, you will be sanctioned. That's just not how lawyers are trained to operate. In fact, there are ethical rules 
that discuss what a lawyer can and can't ask or what evidence a lawyer can and can't put forward. And there's an argument to be made that if you ask a question that you know, you have good reason to know is a completely illegitimate, improper, and objectionable question, and you ask it anyway, you could be violating your ethical duty, whether it's to cater to the court or to act as effective representation, whatever it is. And so lawyers just don't do that. In fact, one of the number one things that we're taught in law school and that I still try to abide by is never end your questioning on a sustained objection, right? I mean, it's just bad. It's a bad look. Law judges don't like it. Jurors don't like it. It's not effective, right? The only thing that, in my opinion, it does is make you, the lawyer, look like a jerk. Movies tend to say, well, it's a way that now the jury has heard that. And there is a legal concept called unringing the bell, right? Where that is something that strategically there are ways to ring a bell that then can't be unrung, but it's not that. That's not how you do that, right? So that is a big pet peeve of mine. Again, it's something that when clients come in, they expect that this may happen. That's not going to happen. If it did, then that's a bad lawyer, in my opinion. Pet peeve number two. This one is a big one, and it's this idea that you see where they're in the middle of trial, it's been heated, it's been going on, and then all of a sudden there's this new piece of evidence that surfaces, whether from the prosecution side or the defense side, but there's this new piece of evidence that comes out, okay? That's, again, just not how it happens for a lot of reasons. First, on the prosecution side, right, they have ethical and legal duties to turn over any and all evidence that they have that's considered exculpatory in nature or that goes to show um, somebody is guilty or innocent. They have to turn that over to the defense well in advance of trial. And I mean months, months before trial. They have to turn over all of their evidence. And if they don't timely disclose that evidence, Typically, they can't use that evidence at trial. Even beyond that, prior to trial, they have to take this mountain of evidence that they've turned over to the defense, and they have to provide a list of here are the 15, 20, 50, sometimes in really complicated cases, 100 documents or pieces of evidence that we plan on introducing, right? So for a year before trial, me as the defense lawyer, I have the state's evidence. And then a couple weeks before trial or a month before trial, I have a cold list of out of that evidence, here's the stuff that they will be introducing. If something's not on that list, they can't use it, okay? Because that would be objectionable, it's against the rules, so on and so forth. The same is typically true on the defense side, at least in, in some jurisdictions. Now, this is one of those ones where local rules are going to differ from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, definitely differ from state to state. So when I'm answering stuff like this, it's at least here in the northern and eastern districts of Texas, where I practice, this is how it works. We have to provide the prosecutor with a list of here's the evidence we plan on using, right? So there is no new evidence. There is no bombshell that gets dropped in 99% of cases. Now, just like anything else, there's these outliers where if there's some extenuating circumstances where it's newly discovered or that can happen, but it's incredibly, incredibly rare. In the vast majority of trials that I've been involved in, I know exactly what evidence the prosecutor is planning on using, and he knows exactly what evidence I'm planning on using. There aren't really, there are surprises in trial, but that's not one of them, right? So this idea that there's this new DNA evidence that just surfaced, or there's this new gunshot residue test, or ballistics just came back on day three of trial, just doesn't happen. And my number one overall pet peeve that I see so many times in legal dramas, TV shows, and movies is the defense lawyer as the bad guy. Time and time again, the defense lawyer is made out to be a villain in the story. It's the law enforcement, it's the prosecutors, it's the DA that are just the virtuous, good, seeking justice uh, individuals and that the defense lawyer is the one that's just out to obstruct, just out to lie, to cheat, to steal their way into getting their client off. And it kills me. I hate it every single time. 
Now, it is true that a lot of law enforcement are really good people. A lot of prosecutors, really good people doing their job, and it's a noble job doing what's right. But that doesn't mean that because they're doing something that is virtuous and good, that what I'm doing is necessarily bad and evil. That dichotomy doesn't exist. And in fact, 90% of my interaction with prosecutors and with law enforcement is very cordial and friendly. I understand that they're just doing their job. They understand that I'm just doing my job. I'm going to put a good argument forward. I'm going to advocate my client in the best way that I know have, or I know how, but within the confines of the rules and ethics and professionalism and courtesy and decency, because that's the way this works, right? And so these movies that show that as soon as a defense lawyer comes on the scene, you know he's a snake, she's a snake. It's just, they're just slimy, they're gross, they're the bad guys. It really reinforces a stereotype that does a lot of damage, I think, to our profession where most of the public, the majority of the public says, I don't want to hire a defense lawyer because if I do, they're going to think I'm guilty because the defense lawyer is the bad guy. That's not our role. It never has been. And so that's my number one pet peeve with a bullet. It's easily the, the thing I despise the, the most in legal dramas and TV shows that I watch. Hope you enjoy this. I know it's a little bit longer of a video than normal, but I really wanted to go over these five things. Um, as always, if you have any questions about this or any topic, please feel free to reach out to me either by email, by phone, or by swinging by the live stream that happens every Sunday night over on my Twitch channel. As always, the uh, link is down in the description. Have a great week next week. Have a killer weekend. Enjoy it. Enjoy the fall and the winter that's coming, depending on where you're living. And as always, be good. Stay on the right side of the bars.